Okay, well, welcome everyone again. My name is Megan Beats. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a 18 year collaborator of Lyndon and Helga LaRouche. And this is the second in the six week class series on Lyndon LaRouche's economic discoveries. So I actually wanted to start just by saying something about what I'm sure people have been seeing on the news, on social media over the course of the past 72 or so hours, which is the rioting in response to the death of George Floyd. And there's a lot to say, a lot that one could say. Um, one thing I do want to say is that it's becoming more and more clear that there's a very nasty, violent element of infiltration and orchestration from the outside. And there's been a lot of evidence. I, I'm fairly confident people have seen some of the discussion around this. Um, this has been now called out by many mayors of major cities, such as the mayor of Chicago, who's asking for help in investigating this, community leaders, and so forth. Um, some people are pointing out that it's reminiscent of the outside infiltration into the um, protests in Hong Kong, which have turned similarly violent. Um, now, however, the reaction to what happened is a very real reaction to a very real atrocity and murder. And it's embedded in a much larger problem. And what you have is you have people who are now sitting at home, who are frustrated, who are dying of COVID maybe, um, who have been laid off. Maybe they couldn't really make a living anyway, and now they again are put in a position of, of financial desperation and so on and so forth. And so we really have to be thinking very carefully about how to prevent tragedy. And what that means is that we have to assert the solution. And this movement, the Schiller Institute, the LaRouche movement has put forward the solution. It's not an immediate solution, but it's a solution. And that is in the economic development program that we've been advocating for 50 years. And the most recent um, iteration of that is the LaRouche plan to reopen the economy to create 1.5 billion productive jobs. The point being, you have to lift people's identities out of the dust. You have to access that which is truly human in each one of us. Um, and you have to have an economic system that cherishes, develops that, and gives every child the opportunity to manifest that. So our job is to insert new ideas into the discussion. And you can just think of the contrast of what was happening over the weekend, the contrast between the violence and the riots and the fact that on Saturday, two Americans were lifted into space from American soil once again on the rocket that took them to the International Space Station. Which one ultimately represents the pathway toward the future? Um, Anyway, so I think that's just important to state because it's on our minds. It is, in a certain sense, part of the context in which our discussion happens. And it puts forward the challenge to us, um, you, as a younger generation, we have to be better than our parents and our grandparents. Um, that's not an insult to them. That's how it's supposed to be in human society. Each generation has to surpass the previous one. So with that, um, let me just get into the economics class. So last week in the introductory class, we got a chance to meet Lyndon LaRouche. We discussed a bit his discoveries in the science of physical economy. We made some jokes about Adam Smith, the lackey of the British Empire. We made some jokes about money and how it's completely inadequate for measuring economics. Um, we came to the fact that the fight for a just economic system that Lyndon LaRouche dedicated his life to has everything to do with the image of man, with ending colonialism, and that if his discoveries had been implemented, poverty would no longer be a phenomenon among mankind, and we would not be facing this pandemic today. And frankly, we might be talking to each other from other planetary bodies. So that was last week. Today, what we're going to get into is the question of economic value. What is value? How can we measure it? 
So I want everybody just to take a moment and think just inside your own head, think about how you would define economic value. What is valuable? Now, because I could not resist, I went on the internet and looked it up, and I found a um, definition from the great resource of Investopedia, which says, economic value represents the maximum amount of money an agent is willing to, and able to pay for a good or service. Elsewhere on Investopedia, economic value is the worth of a good or service determined by people's preferences and the trade-offs they choose given their scarce resources. Now, according to that, does heroin have economic value? People have paid a lot of money for that. Prostitution, is that valuable? Well, according to that definition, yes, it is. And it shouldn't be surprising that some institutions like the European Union would like to include those things in the GDP. Um, how about financial gambling? How about Wall Street? Is that valuable? I want to give an example of the uh, something that Wall Street holds in great value, which are financial instruments like the mortgage-backed security. Now, some of you might that might ring a bell for some of you if you remember the collapse of 2008, which was largely triggered by the collapse of mortgage-backed securities. But ju just to give a quick run through of what this thing is to highlight the absurdity. So a mortgage. I'm sure people know what a mortgage is. I could want to buy a house. I go to my local bank and I take out a loan, which is a mortgage. Now, what happens in today's system is my local bank will sell my mortgage to a big bank, a much larger bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you name it. That larger bank will have bought your mortgage and your mortgage and hundreds and thousands of people's mortgages, will bundle them together, and will then sell slices of the income streams from those mortgages. Remember, people are supposedly paying their mortgages every month. So an investor could buy a slice of the income stream of that mortgage called a mortgage-backed security. Okay. Now, that investor who bought that mortgage-backed security could bundle that income stream together with a bunch of other things called a CDO, a collateralized debt obligation, and could then sell that to somebody else. Right? Now, if you were unable to follow that because that was insane, that's okay. That's good. That's a good sign. But the problem is that at every step along the way, somebody claims a sale in their accounting books, a profit. You've made a profit. Now, according to Investopedia, this is incredibly valuable. There's money being paid everywhere, left and right, for these slices of an income stream. Did they make a profit? Well, according to them, yes, they made a killing. But here's the problem with this. Let's pull up the first slide. OK, so this is a um, heuristic, uh, an, uh, something that Lyndon LaRouche developed, a pedagogical to discuss economic processes that he was first presented in the mid-'90s, I think at a conference at the Vatican. So this is um, what LaRouche called a typical collapse function. So I want you to look just at the top two curves the ones that are labeled financial aggregates and monetary aggregates. So the financial aggregates include the kinds of insane financial instruments I was just describing, mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, et cetera. So you notice the, I guess we cut the year off, on the left is 1971. Over time, toward the present day, the nominal value okay, of those financial instruments has skyrocketed. Now, monetary aggregates is the money which is printed, 
electronically or otherwise in order to sustain the value of those financial aggregates. And we reached a point in roughly 2007, 2008, when the rate of the printing of money was forced to surpass the rate of the creation of the financial instruments just to stop them from blowing out. And that's what happened in the bailouts. Now, the third curve of this, called the triple curve, is the most important. What do you notice with that? That's physical economic input and output. It has been looted. Support for the actual physical economic processes. Think manufacturing. Think infrastructure. Think the train system in your town or your city, which probably is no longer there. Um, Think about all these kinds of things, water systems, all of these things have been looted to prop up nominal value in the financial system. So what we want to do is we want to repair our society's notion of value. So how can we look at value from a physical, not monetary, physical economic standpoint? So we're going to get at this in a couple of different ways. So it just Hang on, it's going to be kind of dense, but that's what the Q&A period's for. Uh, so I want you to think, first of all, think, take a national economy. Well, you know, take your country's economy, the United States, Colombia, whatever it is. Think of a national economy. What's the most important product in that economy? Now remember, we're thinking physical economics. What's the most important product? Say you have a cycle, maybe a one-year or, or quarterly cycle of economic production. What's the most important output? Well, Lyndon LaRouche said, people. People are the most important product of your economy. So we're going to get at that from a couple of different angles tonight. So first I want to pull up the slide. Okay, so what do you see here? You see a chart, a graph of human population growth from 100,000 BC up until roughly the present day. Now, what do you notice? It goes up exponentially. It's skyrocketing. Now, in the year 2000, there were about 6.5 billion people. Today, it's 7.5 billion people, just 20 years later. Now, think in your mind, try to, try to remember, try to think about what are the other species which have population charts like this. The answer is none. No animal species has population growth like this. Animal species populations increase, they exceed their resources, they collapse. They increase, they collapse. Human population growth is different. Now I want to think, I want to uh, just examine this for a minute. I want you to think about the people, can we put the chart back up? Just for a moment. I want you to think about the people on the leftmost side of the chart, from the earliest, uh, not the earliest days of man, that's much longer, but from the earliest part of this chart, the Paleolithic, 100,000 years ago. I want you to think about what they were like. Not their personality so much, but what was their life like? What was their lifespan? From the best estimates, less than 20 years. What was their food like? How did they secure it? What did they need for resources? How did they, what did they need for heat, energy, right? Where could they live? And how many people were there in that kind of society? From the estimates LaRouche gives, given what's required to support each member of the population in terms of those things that I named, probably in the tens of millions of individuals. Okay. Now, compare that to people today, right? It's it's a different world. People today, there are seven and a half billion people living longer lives, more comfortable lives, more productive lives than could have been possible for the most wealthy people of that earlier society. And what LaRouche said is it's 
it, the difference between mankind then and mankind now is equivalent to what in the biosphere would be a different species. Now we're not a different species. There's a constant, and that constant is human creativity, that creative spark. But every other characteristic, for the most part, is as if it's a completely different animal, so to speak, a completely different species. So how did we get from one to the other? Now, you may think, well, duh, technology. Okay, but I wonder, I always wonder, what do people mean when they think of technology? You know, and I was trying to think about that today, and I realized it, a couple of decades ago, I think people's image would have been something like the Jetsons, you know? <laughs> If people have seen that old cartoon, like with flying cars and all sorts of like weird communication and transport systems and robot servants. <laughs> um, nowadays, I think for the most part, at least in the United States, I think when you say technology, I think, I think most people's notion is digital. Something digital, right? My phone, the internet, my Alexa, <laughs> whatever, something digital. Um, which is funny because that's sort of the opposite where we're the slaves and servants of that technology. <laughs> um, but I think also um, what comes along with that is this kind of funny cartoonish image of the creative discoverer, you know, the scientist in his basement who's made a discovery or the scientist in some kind of chem lab where things are exploding in smoke who makes a discovery and somehow that adds up to us having what we see around us, cars, um, airplanes, cell phones, right, whatever, my house, my heating, and all those things. And um, I mean, that's kind of, a, that's a whole other discussion, that's a whole other class that somebody could give on the ordered progression of discoveries. Um, but, so anyway, so what I want to do is I want to actually get a little bit more precise about this idea of what we should mean by technology. And in that, we're going to start to answer the question of how we got from there to here. So I want to use the example of farming, agriculture. So I want you to imagine in your mind a piece of land, untouched nature. We can put the slide up here in case you're having trouble imagining it. So we have untouched nature here. Um, Hoosiers should, Indiana people should recognize this. Um, so let's let's think of this as one square kilometer of land, of trees and grasses and whatever other plants and, and things happen to be there soaking up the sun. Now, what, as human society, what could we get out of this land economically as it is? You know, maybe some wood. I don't know much else, right? <laughs> some wood. I'm not. I'm really. Sh An yeah, we can get animals. That's true. Yeah, wood, animals. Um, it's limited. What I want you to then, with that same piece of land, I want you to think that instead of whatever happens to be there in terms of plant life and animal life, what if we limit the plant life that grows there? to only plants that are useful for human society, like food, corn, wheat, right? Things that we can use. What if we limit the animal life there as much as possible to animal life that's useful for human beings? Cows, for example, right? What if we concentrate it in that land and feed it and water it and irrigate it? It's the same piece of land, the same land area, say a square kilometer. The same amount of sunlight is hitting that square kilometer as hit it before. How much more productive is that square kilometer? How many more people can be supported off of the produce of that land versus the state that it was in prior? So I want to go back to our farmer. Let's put the slide back up. Uh, well, here, uh, there we go. Oh, 
Is that what I wanted? Yeah. Okay. So here are some farmers. This is in the 1800s, I believe. So looking at these farmers, you see they have some kind of cow or ox or what I think that's an ox, whatever it is. And they have a plow hooked up to this animal and they're walking behind the animal with the plow, right? Plowing a row. And then later they'll come through with a bag of seed and they'll throw some seed in the, in the row that they just carved out with the plow and they'll grow food. So the question is how much work in a day, how, how much land could one farmer using this, this apparatus here plant? How much work can this person get done in a day? Well, according to a friend of mine who's a farmer, uh, a person using an ox and a plow maximum could plow two, maybe three acres in a day. Maybe. Okay. Now, if we go back to even earlier technology without the animal, and without the, the metal blade of the plow, maybe a quarter of an acre. You know, a guy with a stick digging a hole, putting a seed in it and stamping on it, maybe a quarter of an acre a day. So this ox is a big advance over that. Now I want to go to this. This is a combine. It's not a plow, but it gets you the idea. Okay? And this. Modern farming today. So with a modern tractor, as opposed to plowing one row at a time with an oxen as your power, your horsepower, um, and covering two acres a day. Today's farmers in industrial tractors can plow 18, 16, 18, 24 rows at a time. The largest planting machines today can plant, plow and plant 50 rows at, at a time, um, being dragged behind these giant tractors. In the cab of these tractors, the farmer is sitting there while the tractor is, a, is driving itself according to a GPS signal. And you see one of these uh, GPS terminals in the top corner there. Um, according to a GPS signal where the land that he is working is mapped out by GPS down to the square meter. And across that land, that machine is going to plow, or say you're planting, will, will have the data based on the fertility of the land from the year before. And will put down, will change the amount of seed that it puts down in that square meter, will squirt different amounts of fertilizer into that square meter as you go along the field, will put in different amounts of insecticide, and so on and so forth. Now, a guy driving such a tractor with this record-setting 50-row planter has worked 1,000 acres in a day. Think about that. Same land. What percent of the farmer's seed came to fruition of the farmer in the 1800s with the oxen versus the farmer with the 50 row planter and the GPS self-driven tractor. Same land, same person, right? New powers, different powers, greater powers. That's technology. And what we're looking at with that difference of what you can produce in a day, given the same land area, is something that LaRouche termed the economy of labor. And actually, it wasn't just LaRouche's term. This is a term that was used by Alexander Hamilton, Henry Carey, and other American system economists. But the, the idea of the economy of labor, labor saving, less labor, more product, that's the effect of technology. OK, so now I want you to think back on that population chart. One effect, which I just hinted at, of the economy of labor, of technology, is that now it takes less land area to support the same amount of people. So you think of that modern farmer and how many people he can feed with his or her labor versus the farmer a couple of hundred years ago. So 
What this gets at, what LaRouche said is, look, therefore, a, a first approximation measurement of economic value is whether or not there's an increase in population density. Okay, so population density, we probably all have a concept of that. But the idea is that given the level of technology in practice, how many people are supported by the labor of that society? How many people per square kilometer? Now, LaRouche said, but that's not quite adequate. What you want to look at is you want to look at relative population density. And the reason is that not all land is created equal. So what I mean by that is you could take the same society with the same level of technology living, let's say, near the equator or in a temperate climate, and they could have one population density. Take that same society and same technology and you, you dump them in the tundra or in northern Siberia, and they're going to have a lower population density, a different effect. So he said, you, we have to not just measure population density, we have to measure relative population density. But he said, that's not quite enough. What we have to look at is potential relative population density. Because the current population is almost always lower than the potential population given a level of technology. So here is what Lyndon LaRouche said about potential relative population density. He said, potential relative population density. This is the rough measure of the superiority of one level of culture over another. This is the measure of economic progress. It is the measure of economy of labor. We must go one step further. The quantity we must measure is the rate of increase of potential relative population density. This measures the rate of economy of labor, the rate at which the productive powers of labor are being increased. For reasons we shall demonstrate in due course, this is the only scientific basis for measuring economic value. The measure of economic value is the rate of increase of potential relative population density relative to the existing level of potential relative population density. Okay, so just to restate that, he's saying the only valid notion of or the litmus test of whether or not something is valuable is whether or not it contributes to increasing the potential relative population density. Okay, so now I want to get uh, a little bit more into that and how we, how could one get a sense of whether we are increasing the potential relative population density? How do we get a sense of whether or not we're increasing that economy of labor or the productive powers of labor. So I want you to think about the throughputs of that national economy that I asked you to think about earlier. And in discussing this, we're going to borrow some terminology from thermodynamics. So I want you to think now of an economy, of your nation's economy, the whole economy, as if it were one firm, one company, right? One operation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to think about all of the economic inputs and outputs of that economy, of that firm, from that standpoint. So I want you to think for a second in your mind. Think about all of the economic activity in the country. Farms, um, manufacturing, machine tools, auto repair shops, hairdressers, tattoo parlors, um, nurses, right? You could go on and on. Doctors, Uber drivers, um, waitresses, whatever. Think about the totality of the economic activity in the country. So LaRouche divides that into two categories. He divides it into 
a category of those who are in the productive part of the economy. And what he means by that are people who are directly involved in the industrial manufacturing or mining sector of the economy, <coughs> excuse me, or agriculture. Now, the reason that's important is because those that is the segment of the labor force which produces everything that is consumed by that economy. Now, for pedagogical purposes, we're treating this as, an, as a closed economy, a closed system. So that productive part of the labor force produces everything that's consumed by the totality of society. Now, the other category of the labor force, LaRouche calls overhead. We'll get a little bit more at this. Overhead, um, doctors, right, teachers, um, waitresses, what else? What else is overhead? Drug Scientist. Scientists, astronauts, drug dealers, Uber drivers. Uber drivers, yes. So those, and, and we'll talk a little bit more, we'll, we'll separate those people out in the overhead category a little bit more. But that's overhead, right? People who are not part of the productive segment of the labor force. Now, I want to start with the productive part of the labor force. So LaRouche said what we have to do when we're thinking about inputs and outputs, in order to, to sidestep the trap of money, and we're all so habituated to thinking in terms of money, my paycheck, right? In order to sidestep that, LaRouche says we have to think in terms of market baskets. So we'll take a category, um, just to illustrate what I mean, we'll take the households of the people who are part of the productive labor force, right? So imagine you're a machinist. Think about, for your household, what are all of the consumer goods that you need to sustain your household? Your food, your water, your utilities, your electricity consumption, um, you know, the actual materials of your house, if there's any home repair, things like this. Um, you know, what, all of the physical goods, your, the, the piano that your child is learning to play, all of those things are part of the market basket of the household of that worker. Okay. Now, when that worker goes to work and works in that machine shop or factory or farm or whatever it is, there are also goods, there's a market basket of goods that that person needs at work. Machines the electricity that, that, that powers those machines, the water, the transportation system that brings in the raw material goods and takes out the, the finished or partly finished goods, right? All of the things that sustain that person when they're producing, when they're working. That's the other part of it. Um, just to give you a quick example, in our um, healthcare report that uh, that's up on the Schiller Institute website, our proposal for a global health care system, we cite some figures for hospitals, just to give you a sense of it. So a large hospital in the United States, on average, consumes 44 million gallons of water per year. It's a lot of water. Um, on average, a large hospital in the U.S. consumes 19 million kilowatt hours of power. Um, so let's actually bring up the slide. So that might be a little bit hard to see. We'll, I'll zoom in in a second. But this is um, something which came to be affectionately known as the bar diagram of LaRouche, of LaRouche's economics textbook. Um, so on the left, you see represented the total labor force. And you see that there are, of the labor force, there are people who are too young to work and there are people who are too old to work. And then in the middle, mature, you have the working labor force. So we're just gonna zoom in here. Um, don't worry about those letters yet, I will explain them. Um, we're just gonna zoom in on the industrial, the manufacturing segment of the labor force. So those uh, two categories at the bottom, C and V, that's what I just named. So C is are all of the, the capital goods required by the industrial process. 
and V are all of the consumer goods required by the household of that worker. So LaRouche says C plus V, that's the energy of the system. That's, which is a thermodynamic term. That's everything that has to be consumed by the process of production of that economy. So we're talking about all of the physical input that produces all of the physical output that supports that society. So now I want to get to the overhead, and that's the category LaRouche labels D. So overhead is divided into two types. We have necessary overhead, and that's your teachers, your doctors, your administrative officials, your whatever, train operatives, you know, train drivers, all of those things. Those are people whose work is necessary for the process of production, right? For keeping it going, for keeping it at the current level, like educators, for example. Then there's economic waste. So economic waste would include people like Mike Pompeo. It would include people like um, people who are unemployed, not that they're wasteful people, but the fact that they're not working is a waste for society. It would include people whose, what, you know, what they do is actually destructive, like drug dealers or Wall Street brokers or prostitutes. So, so again, so this overhead category is divided into necessary and waste. Now, the reason that's important is that nobody in that overhead category produces what's needed what's consumed by the society. Therefore, their livelihood and their work is supported by C plus V, by the output of C plus V. Now, so let's think about this. If you have a productive process where what's produced by C plus V is actually more than what it took to produce, so to say that differently, if the input to C plus V produces an output which is greater than what was put into it, then you have what LaRouche called surplus, S, right? So we produced more than we consumed, we have a surplus. Now part of that surplus has to go into supporting the overhead category of the population. Anything left over after that is what LaRouche calls S prime or free energy to bar again, borrow a term from thermodynamics. What is, what is free energy in a thermodynamic system? It's that which is capable of doing work. That which is capable in this case of doing new work. Free energy in physical economy is the only valid notion of profit. It's that which can be reinvested into the productive process to make improvements. So for example, um, you know, what, what, what is a manifestation of S prime, of real physical profit in the economy? Well, we might reinvest into improving the, or upgrading the technology in machine shops, right? Uh, an, an owner of a machine shop might choose to upgrade to laser machining. We might build new concert halls. We might build a maglev train system. We might build a new research center. We might divert a, portion, a, a larger portion of our labor force into research and development, into fusion research. So that is the valid notion of profit. Now, Okay, so I know I went through that quickly, so I expect we can have some more discussion of that in the Q&A, but that at least gives us a more solid stage or a more real stage upon which we can think through the notion of whether something is valuable in the economy. But the most interesting part is not just that bar diagram that I showed you and thinking through those relationships, it gets much more interesting when we put it into motion. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's put up the slide. Oops, yep, 
there we go. Okay, so LaRouche says, you have to put this into motion and think about this process over time. So what are some things that are necessary for a healthy, growing physical economy? Well, LaRouche said, first of all, the market basket V, right, the, the, the household of the, the productive worker, V has to grow. We want that to grow over time, right? We want people to have both, uh, both in quantity, also in quality. We want people to have better foods, better access to what they need. So V has to grow. But C also has to grow. In a healthy economy, C will be growing faster than V. So in other words, the kind of investment that we, the input and investment we put into the productive process will be growing faster than into V. So C plus V is growing. If C and V are growing, D, the overhead, is necessarily growing. Now why? If we're using more complicated technologies in our productive process, for example, we're going to need a longer period of training and education, teachers. If we have more complicated medical equipment, we're going to need a longer uh, period of training for doctors, for example, and so on and so forth. So D is growing. Now, in all of this, if the economy is not going to run down and consume all of the surplus, then the profit has to be growing even faster. Okay, so here's where we get to the real paradox. So all of this is growing over time. But I want you to think about the effect of reinvesting S prime. Okay, so remember S prime is, is the leftover surplus output after we've already um, supported the productive process and the overhead. Now, if we reinvest S prime, for example, into making more modern manufacturing centers, right, with much more modern and complicated manufacturing technology, or if we expand our productive process, if we do that, the cost of production increases. Production, the productive process is now more expensive. Now that gets to a paradox that doesn't seem to be what we want to do. So LaRouche says this. He says, the apparent effect of reinvestment of free energy to increase the energy of the system is to increase the costs of the economy per capita, which might appear to be directly opposite to the result required. Okay? So I want you to hold that in your mind. And I want to give you an example of how we can resolve this paradox. And the way I want to do that is I want to give you an example of S prime. So I'm going to show a little video clip, which I narrated. Inside of a fusion reactor, the fusion plasma consisting of an ultra-hot ionized gas reaches temperatures of tens and hundreds of millions of degrees. Some of this plasma can be funneled off as a direct process medium for industrial purposes. The plasma will first be taken through a connection zone to isolate it from the plasma of the reactor and remove high energy neutrons from the process plasma. It is then moved to what is called the interaction zone. With the ultra-high heats and energies of fusion plasmas, metal ores or any other known material fed into the fusion torch are not merely melted, but are immediately shock vaporized and become part of the plasma as separate ionized elements and electrons. This now low temperature plasma, full of the elements which made up the ore or other material, is discharged from the fusion torch to a separation chamber 
so that the individual materials can be separated from one another and recovered. Once in a plasma state, various methods can be used to select the desired elements and isotopes based on their atomic as opposed to chemical properties. The plasma separation process utilizes the unique resonating frequency, or cyclotron frequency, of specific elements to selectively separate them. As the plasma, spiraling around the guiding magnetic field, is passed through a chamber, it is zapped with a very specific electromagnetic frequency, precisely tuned to the resonant frequency of a selected isotope. The targeted ions are energized, widening their orbits just beyond the width of a series of collection plates at the end of the chamber. The rest of the non-energized materials simply pass through. Okay, so with the fusion torch, we completely change our relationship to mining raw materials. You can dump anything into that and it will be shock vaporized. For example, materials from landfills can be dumped into the fusion torch and we can separate them out into their constituent elements and gather the raw materials that we need. Now this depends on having a fusion reactor that this fusion torch is attached to. The fusion torch is very expensive. <laughs> Not monetarily, physically. This is very expensive. The GPS farmer, the GPS tractor, is very expensive. Right? Compare how much more expensive that one person driving that amazing tractor is versus, you know, the one guy with his mule who has to feed it some hay and you know, make sure it stays warm at night and sharpen the blade on his plow. So much more goes into supporting the more advanced process. But what's the effect? What's the effect of the increase in productivity in the productive powers of labor? That's what we want to look at. It's not the stuff. It's the, it's the leap forward in productivity. And LaRouche says there is the solution to your paradox. There is how you overcome that seeming paradox of making your productive process more expensive. It's that incredible leap in our powers over nature. Um, now, you want to think about where does that come from? Where does everything that went into that GPS tractor farmer come from? Where does the fusion torch come from? It comes from the human mind. It comes from that leap of discovery, that insight into a new principle of nature. And I just want to bring up the last slide here. So this is probably kind of hard to see, uh, but this is a chart that LaRouche used um, in writings on the machine tool principle. And you can just take a look at it. It's actually a little too hard for me to read from this distance, but um, you can take a look at it. So I want you to look at the inputs and the outputs. So our input, actually, I should probably pull this up so I can read it. So our input, LaRouche says, are the current levels of development of individual creative reason. That's your first economic input. The levels of development of individual creative reason. That leads to discoveries of valid principles. That leads to discoveries of new hypotheses. And then that leads simultaneously to a classical humanist education and a more educated developed workforce. It also leads to new machine tool designs, new technologies in manufacturing, right? New product designs, infrastructure designs, and so on, right? These two things lead to increased productivity in the productive process 
and an increase in the potential relative population density. And here's the key. What does an increase of the potential relative population density produce? It produces higher levels of development of individual creative reason. So think back to what I said at the beginning about what LaRouche said about the product, the most important product in the economy, it's people. The real input into an economic process is human creative thought. And then the manifestation of the different kinds of things I, I went through in terms of the productive process, the output is a higher level of creative thought. So before we get into, it took a little bit longer than I hoped, but um, what I want to do is, uh, before we get into the q and I want to play a short clip of Lyndon LaRouche speaking in uh, 2010. And I think now that we've gone through what we went through, I think now you'll, you'll have a better grasp on what he about, he's about to say. So we'll do this, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Now, the point is, if those who forecast on the basis of statistical trends in recorded transactions are idiots. Because in economy, financial values attributed to the, by the accountants are usually far distant from any reality. And everyone, is even more so these days, is cheating. They're lying. They are showing transactions as book transactions in dollar amounts, and there's nothing to back it up, except the assumption that some sucker is going to buy this thing out at a higher price with an also worthless kind of payment. So you, there is, in the most simplest sense, in this simple sense, the worst thing you can do as a forecaster is to believe in financial forecasting, so-called financial market forecasting. Only an idiot believes in it. But as long as there are idiots who believe in it more than somebody else, the somebody else who can swindle a, a more stupid person into buying into it does so. Um, and therefore, you build up a gigantic bubble of absolutely worthless paper. What this means is that you're coming down, that your apparent growth is a result of your collapse. What you appear to claim as growth is a basis, is actually a product of the fact that you are collapsing. And that's what's wrong with your forecaster, the, the mo in the most obvious way. There are other reasons for this. If you believe in, the, if you believe in job sales rather than in value of product, and production value, you're also being stupid. The guys who say we're going to solve the U.S. economy by providing jobs, you're not going to solve the U.S. economy, solve its problems by creating jobs. You've got to create productive jobs. You have to control the ratio of manufacturing, which must be sufficiently high and must be sufficiently technologically progressive to sustain the market as a whole. If you're creating jobs without creating productive jobs, you're, just, you're buying into doom. If you don't understand that technological progress is necessary, if you don't understand that the existence of the economy depends upon the fact that the, as the economy grows and as we use up the richest concentration of natural resources, we are the economy is going to collapse unless we increase the capital intensity of investment in production and advance in technology. If you're going to windmills, windmills, the windmill as a source of electrical power is a loser. That is, if you take the cost of the construction and operation of the windmill and the cost of pulling it down when it wears out, the total income of, from a windmill in terms of electrical power is a loser. Whereas if you take the same amount of money and invest, invest in that for that amount of power in nuclear power, your profit and your productivity zooms. The productivity, therefore, depends upon the increase of the capital intensity and technology, technological progress of investment. It also depends upon the ratio of the number of people in the labor force who are productive as such, as producers, 
who are, represent an improved technology at a higher capital intense level. And that the other functions depend upon comparable advances in the technology of services and so forth. For example, medical services and all these kinds of things, all kinds of services. So therefore, technological, scientific, technological, and cultural progress in developing the minds and bodies and physical powers of human beings is the only source of keeping even level in terms of the productive powers of labor. labor. So therefore, otherwise, you're suffering from attrition. Same, same as that. 